Success Stories on CAP 35 News is sponsored by Steve Dahl and Associates. Advertising, public relations, graphic design, brochures, logos, videos. Steve Dahl and Associates. More than great ideas. Tonight's success story features a local financial institution that has escaped the trappings of a large corporation, but they still do more business in one area than any other bank in the state. Cap 35's Paul Shoemaker has the story. Pioneer Bank in downtown Yakima has emerged from the big bank takeovers to be Central Washington's only locally owned bank. They started in 1977 with 350 local investors, and today they're listed as one of the highest rated banks in the country. President Paul Campbell says that quality is mainly due to the loyalty of local people who like to deal with a local bank that supports the community. Local banks uh, only have one place to invest their money uh, primarily and that's right in their trade area where you take uh, regional banks and nationwide banks and that sort of thing uh, are, are going to invest where they can get the highest return. Well we really only have one place to invest and, and that's in our local trade market. Pioneer Bank offers all the regular banking services, but their forte is helping businesses get on their feet in central Washington with small business administration loans. We are the leading bank in the inland northwest by a large margin. In fact, we make uh, more SBA loans uh, in, in the inland northwest than all of the statewide major banks combined. Campbell says one of the bank's big assets is the staff. Many have worked there 10 years or longer. And he says they also strive to meet the philosophy of providing outstanding responsiveness to customers. Campbell says he sees outstanding opportunities for the future for Pioneer Bank as the only locally owned bank in an area where economic growth looks to be a sure thing. Paul Shoemaker reporting for CAP 35 News. Campbell says slow growth in the central Washington area during the early 80s has increased to healthy economic growth today. He says that trend should continue. Well, it's Monday night. That means another Monday night football game coming up. And unless they've been under a rock, they know you're from Cleveland. They know where your heart is tonight. Browns by seven. I'm going to go Brown, out on a win. Browns, Browns by seven. By seven. Yeah. Up next on Cap 35 News, bullets fly as a feud between two Yakima families continue. A new national survey shows a growing trend of violence in schools. We're going to check on the local trend tonight. And certain video games may soon become off limits to minors. Don't go away. Cap 35 News next. Now, the local news you need from the people you know. This is Cap 35 News at 5:30. Yakima's most complete local news coverage with Dave Evelyn, Dana Cowley, sports with Michael King, and weather with Shannon Brinius. With the Yakima Valley's top stories, this is CAP 35 News. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to CAP 35 News this Thursday. I'm Dave Edel. Thank and you And I'm Dana Cowley. Glad you could join us. Tonight's top story, how to stop a drive-by family feud before it turns fatal. Now, police say these families have been fighting for a long time, and they also say they have some evidence that indicates that these same families have been involved in several drive-by shootings in the last year. Police also think the latest occurred just last night. It was at a home on Swan Avenue, and it was the third such shooting in the last three weeks. Somebody shot at a man as he was working on his car. No one was injured, but police and neighbors know it's only a matter of time before somebody is hurt or killed. Police say they're doing what they can, but they haven't gotten a lot of cooperation from the families involved, and as a result, there have been no arrests made in any of these shootings. Now, the neighbors are tired of this ongoing dispute. This is the second drive-by in two weeks alone on Swan Avenue. As CAP 35's Monique Gamache reports, while some have an idea of what this fighting is all about, they know for sure that the problem won't be solved by using guns. At around 8 o'clock last night, 27-year-old Jesus Ariano was working on his car in front of his Swan Avenue home. A car drove by and five or six shots were fired. The shots missed Ariano, but those shots and others have frightened some neighbors into moving away from the area. One lady was so scared of retaliation that she refused to be seen or heard on tape, but she did tell us how angry and upset she's become. She says, I love this house. I love it here, but I have to move. My kids are scared, especially my youngest, who won't even go out to play in the front yard. Police think the shooting is in retaliation for several shootings across town on East Adams Street. Barbara Escobar's house has been hit many times. 
Three weeks ago, someone shot at Barbara and her son in the family car. And last summer, shots were fired at another Escobar home in Yakima. A neighbor of the Escobars, also afraid to go on camera, is tired of the violence. It's scary. It's very scary because um, my kids are afraid to sit right here. They sit in the living in the floor. The bullets fl flies everywhere. And I'm scared they might hit my kids. My son's scared to play outside. He can't play outside. It's my daughter. I don't let her outside either. The neighbor believes the Arianos and other local families have been shooting at the Escobars because the Escobars won't join their gang. Police believe there are some other families involved in these shootings, but they say it's been hard to make any arrests because neither side will cooperate. Monique Kamash, Cap 35 News. One of the neighbors says if she could afford to, she would move her family to another home outside of this line of fire. Well, you know, it's driving the neighbors nuts, and it's causing some headaches for the police department as well. The Yakima Police Department says it's at wit's end in trying to solve this ongoing family dispute, so they have called a truce in hopes of ending the violence. Police say they've responded to dozens of calls related to this ongoing feud dating back to last summer. But Yakima Police Sergeant Craig Baird says every time that they try to put a case together, no one's willing to testify, fearing further retaliation. So police are going to try another step. What we're trying to do actually is uh, trying to arbitrate uh, between these two families, trying to get them to uh, you know, settle our differences other than uh, by such violent means. I mean, we would much, much prefer uh, these two selling their differences otherwise uh, through uh, talking it out primarily, if, if that's the safest way. Sergeant Baird says it's frustrating that people won't step forward to help, but he's putting a plea out to all citizens, asking them to call him if they see anything that could help them with this case. Bottom line, no one's been arrested or charged with any crimes in any of these drive-by shootings. Now, if arrests should come, offenders would face reckless endangerment charges, which carry a maximum sentence of five years in jail and a $10,000 fine. And while we're on the subject of drive-by shootings, there have been plenty. Police have reports of two other drive-by shootings in the last three weeks and another incident in which a teenager was shot at while driving his car. No injuries in any of those shootings, and there aren't any suspects either. Police don't believe these other incidents are related to the family feud. Yana? And the crime-related news tonight continues. Two men are in custody today after getting caught in the act of burglarizing an auto body shop. The Yakima police responded to a silent alarm last night at Van Cleves on Division Street. The alarm went off around 8 o'clock. When police arrived, Bobby Yarberry and Danny Hall were driving a truck through a closed garage door. Police aren't sure how Yarberry and Hall got into this building, but both will be facing second-degree burglary charges. Meanwhile, the trial continued today for a man and a wife accused of possessing about 15 pounds of cocaine and $75,000. The trial of Jose Castellano and Griselda Ceballos began yesterday in Yakima County Superior Court. Now this case marks the second largest drug bust in Yakima County's history. Attorneys for Ceballos and C Castellano say the couple was told that their lives would be in jeopardy if they didn't keep the drugs and the money in their house. But prosecutors believe this Yakima home was the center of a Yakima drug ring. Castellano and Ceballos were arrested back in November. Dave? A 23-year-old Seaside, Oregon man has pled innocent to killing a woman from Yakima. Isaac Villasenor Perez is one of two men indicted in the slaying of 30-year-old Brenda Lee Butler. Butler's body was found along a logging road near Seaside in mid-December. She died of a stab wound to the chest. Villasenor Perez entered the plea yesterday in circuit court in Astoria. 35-year-old Octavio Serrato of Seaside was also arrested in connection with the murder. Serrato is in California awaiting extradition. You know, the town of Tyaton hasn't had a police officer patrolling its streets for some 20 years. But that's all changed with the addition of two police officers this past month. Cap 35's Ron Zwerin spent the day in Titan, and he tells us that the people feel safer now that there's a new chief in town. Tom Weesey is the new chief of police in Titan. That's some feat, considering that this town of just 855 hasn't had a police chief in over 20 years. And just because this town is small, it's not exempt from crime. We have some juvenile problems that, you know, plague all communities. But I think what they're doing is they've experienced a 23% growth in population over the last three years. And I think they've uh, project a steady growth like that. And they just wanted to make sure that they had the personalized service. 
service and safety, almost everyone in Tyatin knows the chief. They're here, they're 24 hours, they're right here in town, and which, which we need, which the community needs. Dave Howie is the only barber in Tyatin, and as he waits for his next customer to walk through the door, he feels safe, knowing the chief is nearby. I feel that the town needs it uh, for the protection in the small community. Uh, a 24-hour patrol is going to be great. Uh, the problems we had here before, people would call the sheriff department, it would take them a long time for them to come up, and now we have them right here in town. It's fantastic. It's great. Others agree. Well, I think it'll do a lot for public relations and uh, just the whole uh, city in general. They need a little law enforcement here. We've had uh, problems in the past about response time, and we're excited about the new sheriff coming in and uh, being right here with us all the time. I like it, especially if it's going to cut down on the crime and the problems that we have around the area. It'll be a good idea. And for the other residents of Tyaton, a good idea indeed. Ron Zwerin, Cap 35 News. Weesey says that although his patrol area is only about one square mile, his responsibility is great, and he says keeping the town of Tyaton safe is very rewarding. Most parents, they'd agree with this. The schools are the last place we need to worry about acts of violence. But a new survey says differently. That story next. Plus, the season of good tidings is over, and now it's time to say good riddance to one of the last holiday symbols. A green way to get with, rid of your Christmas tree in just a moment. And for listeners on AM 1460, KMWX Sports and Weather coming up. All throughout the country, violence is on a rise in our schools. Alcohol, drug abuse, gun access, and poverty. Those are among the main causes of concern in the nationwide survey on this issue. So how do Yakima schools stack up? Local school districts say over the past five years, the amount of violence has increased. Student violence liaison Jean Rospold says the first step in reducing the, the amount of violence is increasing community awareness. To not de to deny that there's a problem or a potential of a problem and uh, there's more young people that have access to weapons and as a result there's that great potential that you know those things can occur in our schools he says parents need to become more involved in their children's lives he says too many kids aren't getting enough positive reinforcement there's one positive note on that davis high school has seen a reduction in crime and they're one of the few schools in the area that are seeing that slide the other way. It's good to know. All right, good for them. And on the subject of violence in schools and throughout the country, a lot of folks say the amount of violence seen on TV, particularly on some TV screens in the form of video games, is partly to blame. Under pressure from Congress, the electronic games industry has devised a rating system so that parents can choose what games are okay for their kids. Games such as Mortal Kombat and Night Trap picture graphic acts of violence. Crazy Mike's video in Yakima no longer carries Night Trap because of the recent controversy. Manager Thad Johnson says, although he agrees with the concept, he thinks the rating system I may think the rating backfire. System is needed to a point, but I'm kind of afraid of the of the backlash of rating something negative and the hype that it will get from interviews like this and everything else. The kids will be in here too much running, running the bad stuff instead of the good stuff. The new rating system is similar to movie ratings. A GA rating is for general audiences, an MR rating suggests parental discretion, or discretion, and if the video game has an MR 13 rating, video dealers won't rent it unless you're over the age of 13. Counselors preparing high school seniors for college and other future choices say students are choosing post-high school education more carefully than ever. Thousands of Central Washington high school seniors are entering their final few months of school and they now face the difficult decision of college, tech school or the world of work. Counselor Mike Hubert says students are looking more at specific programs rather than at schools alone, so students are really more or less shopping around. We find in the schools that we are having to rely uh, more and more on, on technology. Uh, Next on CAP 35 News, the Yakima County authorities have arrested the person they believe is the owners of those pit bulls who mauled a man to death last week. Plus, a popular bird hunting area near Union Gap is off limits to sportsmen this year. Find out why. Stay tuned. Your news is next. 
With your total news coverage for Yakima and Kittitas Valleys, this is CAP 35 News at 5.30. Good evening. Welcome to CAP 35 News. I'm Dana Cowley. The owner of those pit bulls that killed a man, he's been found, and that's our top story tonight. This morning, the Yakima County Sheriff's Department arrested 38-year-old Edward Bash. Police believe he is the owner of those dogs. He was staying at the home of Larry Delzer at 3109 Castlevale. Last Friday, those dogs wandered and they ended up in Walter Feaser's backyard. Those two pit bulls killed Feaser and then he seriously injured a neighbor who was trying to save Feaser. Police initially thought that Delzer was the owner of the dogs. Although officials believe they have found the real owner now, charges still may be filed against Delzer. You know, whether or not Mr. Bash was in fact gone for a day or two, I don't know that uh, to be correct or not. They may have been left in his care and custody. Uh, at the very least, he's not been completely forthright about who the owner was, and I think that he's subject to some other criminal offenses as a result of that. Bash has not officially been charged with anything yet, and he will be held until a court appearance on Monday. Under the dangerous dog statute, Bash could be charged with a felony that carries a maximum of five years in prison and or a $10,000 fine. Well, the war is over. That's what the troops are saying at the Yakima Training Center today as Cascade Sage 95 came to a close. The final battle took place this morning, and after all of the time spent in the field, most of these soldiers are ready to go home now. 45 days is a long time. You have a good time out here? War is hell. No, you don't have fun at war. <laughs> war is hell. But cleaning up after Cascade Sage takes a lot more than washing 3,000 vehicles and trucking 10,000 troops back to Fort Lewis, there are environmental concerns. The Yakima Indian Nation tried to block this whole operation because of those concerns, but that was denied. The center commander says the Army will begin an assessment and a cleanup process to leave this land just like it was before the operation took place. will be filled up. Uh, um, the area will be checked for hazardous material spills. All the normal things that we've always done will occur. Army officials are calling this exercise a success. Edwards says valuable training was accomplished without any major injuries. A Wapato man died in a car accident. It happened yesterday afternoon on North Hera and Wapato roads. According to the Washington State Patrol, 76-year-old George Weeks was driving westbound on West Wapato, didn't stop at the stop sign. He hit another car that was driven by Victor Wood. Weeks died instantly. Wood received minor injuries. The United Nations turned 50 years old this week. Bit of trivia for you. And while most of the celebrating took place in New York City, there were some Sunnyside school children who took note of this event. CAP 35's Alex Peach visited Chief Kamayakan Elementary to bring us this report. The tune may sound familiar, but this isn't Itsy Bitsy Spider. It's the national anthem of Leafland, a brand new country created in Mrs. Schmick's fourth grade class. Each team has developed uh, their own nation and their own maps and flags and costumes. There's a, like six or seven different criterion, and then we'll put it all together and we will be a world or a universe of our own. The kids develop everything about their countries, from designing a national flag <laughs> no, it's red, white, blue. to their own systems of money. They're shaped like stars. And these founding mothers and fathers have some pretty good ideas, like candy bar land, for example. You eat a lot of candy and you never get fat or cat and you never get cavities. It's all a lesson in working together. They um, have to cooperate because they have to come up with their name or their nation all that they all agree on. So they have to cooperate in that. Then they have to use a variety of media and the supplies are given to them and that's all they have. But more importantly, it sparks their imaginations. There's a lot of different places, but um, these are the most different that I've ne ever seen. And they and it's just really strange and it'd be nice to have all these different nations that you could go and see the world. In Sunnyside, I'm Alex Peach, Cap 35 News. Mrs. Schmidt says she does this project every year with her class, but this 50th anniversary of the UN makes this year extra special. Here's something special too. You can learn CPR for free tomorrow. It's the second annual CPR Saturday class and it's going to be going on from 9 until noon. It's a chance for anybody living in this area to brush up on their CPR skills. 
Only one-third of residents in Yakima County know CPR. Even fewer in the Hispanic community are trained. People need to get ready in case there's an emergency. There will be bilingual interpreters available tomorrow to teach people that do not speak English um, CPR. The Hispanic population has a survival rate of about 3%, and that's a, a figure we'd really like to see change. The class is being held at the Yakima Convention Center. All you have to do is show up between 9 and 4. Class takes just about an hour. The Eisenhower High School students don't have any more excuses about being late to class. They'll have to make up some new ones. The high school bridge connecting the east and the west building was open today. The principal of the school says now the kids won't have to walk outside, which should get them to class on time. During the passing times, we have so many kids in the hallways. The group that is upstairs goes down first, and then the kids that are downstairs come upstairs. And this will hopefully help kids to get to class on time. It's been a real problem here for some number of years. It'll be a, a lot better because there's a lot of people in the school this year, so it won't be all crowded. It, it'll be easier just for some people to come through here and some people to go down if they have to go down. The bridge work started last year and this project came in on budget and on time. A local heavyweight hero, he's back. He's here. With your total news coverage for Yakima and Kittitas Valleys, this is Cap 35 News at 5.30. Good evening. Welcome to Cap 35 News. I'm Dana Cowley. The public got its first look today at that teenager accused of a deadly shooting in Moses Lake. The tragedy happened late Friday afternoon. This afternoon, the students were back in school while one of their classmates stood in front of a judge accused of murder. With his arms and legs restrained, the young suspect moved slowly with his head down, looking dazed. It was Barry Lukaitis' first court appearance since Friday's deadly shooting rampage at his Moses Lake Junior High School. The 14-year-old's parents sat quietly behind him during the proceedings. The suspect softly answered yes as the judge asked him if he understood the charges against him. Those charges include three counts of first-degree murder and one count of attempted murder. He was just a little boy, and I don't know what made him snap. Uh, maybe we, ne we never will either. Right now, Lukaitis is under the juvenile system's control, but the prosecutor promises the suspect will be... We had a problem with that tape. We'll try to have more information on that story for you in just a few moments. Meanwhile, court officials say a hearing will be held in just a couple of weeks to decide if that teen will be tried as an adult. If convicted as an adult, he could face life in prison. Violence smashed the small town image of Moses Lake, striking deep into its heart and turning the most innocent, the children, into victims. The Moses Lake shootings are prompting local school officials here to take a good close look at their own security plans. Now, one of the greatest security problems for Davis High School in downtown Yakima is its location. Not only do they have to control all the students on campus, but they have to watch for the outsiders who can come off from the streets in almost any direction. Over the last three years, this district has hired both a full-time police officer and a security monitor. The Moses Lake shootings have renewed awareness of possible violence that could happen at Davis or anywhere, but security has been a strong focus here for years. It surely heightens our need for security, but it is it's, it's something that we've worked on uh, and the district has worked on uh, very aggressively in the last, uh, especially in the last two and a half years. In other news tonight, a man has been charged as a material witness in a double murder case in Toppenish. Police say Jesus Maravilla witnessed the death of 29-year-old Jose Barrientos and 33-year-old Ignacio Garcia. Both of those men were from Othello. Their bodies were found in this burned car last month. Police have a warrant charging Marcos Lopez with two counts of first-degree murder. Mara Villa is accused as a material witness in this case. He was already booked into the Yakima County Jail under a narcotics, under a narcotics warrant from last year. Meanwhile, authorities are still looking for Marcos Lopez. Yakima police arrested two men last night in two separate murders, two separate robberies, excuse me. The first happened at the Dairy Queen on Fifth Avenue. Police say a man in his 40s walked into the restaurant and he demanded all the money from the clerk. He was arrested a few minutes later just down the street. Now the second robbery was at the AMPM on 16th and West Washington. This suspect came into the store, pointed a gun at the clerk, demanding money. 
Two customers who were in the store were forced to lie down on the floor. The suspect was arrested a short time later at his home. Police have not released the names, though, of these two robbery suspects. Every year, thousands of people have heart attacks. Some don't even know it. And that's why the American Heart Association's motto for American Heart Month is don't die of embarrassment. CAP 35's Renee McCullough looks at the symptoms of heart attacks and why it is important to get to the doctor, even if you're not sure. About every 20 seconds, an American suffers from a heart attack. But for many victims, the symptoms are so minor, they don't even know what's happened. It's subtle that I think uh, at least two-thirds of the time, they just say, no, nah, it couldn't be, and they just deny it. That's right. Dr. Booth says it's better to be safe than sorry. He says you're better off to come in and be a little embarrassed if nothing's wrong, rather than risk problems later. Missing a heart attack and then kind of, you know, leading the rest of your life, your heart will not be as strong. So then you have to work on building it up again, and you'll, you'll have to start an exercise program, which could help, but you will always lose part of that muscle. <laughs> That's why it's important to get help within two hours of an attack. That's when the drugs that open the arteries and release the flow of blood work the best. The medicine that we give now can actually dissolve a clot and then perfuse that muscle, save the muscle of, the, of your heart, and, and, uh, and you end up with a much better outcome. A lot of times people don't do anything because they don't know they've had an attack. Some of the warning signs include an uncomfortable pressure, fullness, squeezing or pain in the center of the chest, pain that spreads to the shoulders, necks, or arms, lightheadedness, fainting, sweating, nausea, or shortness of breath. Renee McCullough reporting for CAP 35 News. Each night this week, we're going to have a homework assignment to help your heart get healthy. Tonight's assignment is to sign up for a CPR class, and we've done a little bit of the work for you this time. There is a class for people who are around children coming up Saturday, February 17th. That starts at 9. The phone number is 454-6391, or if that isn't a good time, you can call Providence Hospital at 575-5058, and they'll give more information to you. Ice jams on the lower Yakima River have some people in Benton County heading for higher ground. Details on that next. Plus, the cold weather has some Yakima City employees wishing they were high and dry. We can explain when we come back. If you're listening on Yakima's oldie station, 1460 KMWX, sports and weather coming up. Warmer temperatures later this week. Flash flood warnings are causing residents all along the Yakima to prepare for unpredictable weather. Farms like this have already suffered damages, like torn fences and dead livestock. Farmers expect the next thawing to be the worst yet. Benton County Emergency Management says due to several ice jams along the river and an increased flow of water, flooding could occur rapidly and without warning. They advise residents along the river to move their livestock to higher ground, especially during the daylight hours. City businesses are paying the price for last week's bitterly cold temperatures. Problems have been reported at Yakima's wastewater treatment plant, the new police station, and the public works building. CAP 35 Cindy Andrew shows us the damage freezing pipes have caused to the public works building today. Not any hot water here when we came to work. No hot water in the break room started the freezing pipes incident and it's ending with the replacement of the entire plumbing system at the Yakima Public Works Department and the building is only two years old. When we get a cold snap like this, it's just unbelievable that something like this would happen. Currently, the building does not have any water, although it's expected to be turned on by tomorrow. The Yakima Public Works Department is operating on a skeleton crew. Employees were sent home early Friday, and only half are back to work today. Just came pouring into this room. Offices are soaking wet, and crews are trying to install new pipes. Haddix believes the pipes froze because the insulation was not properly installed. However, who or what is at fault remains to be seen. We're going to have to explore what responsibility lies where with uh, design, original design, architectural design, and contractor uh, uh, responsibility, or whether this is natural causes. ZACE estimates at least $15,000 damage. Meanwhile, the department is continuing to work as much as they can without disrupting service to the public. Street crews are not affected. It's only the administrative offices. Haddix expects to be busier later this week as more pipes throughout the city thaw out. 
there's a greater potential for them to burst. So Haddock says it's best to make sure your own water shutoff valve is working properly instead of having to wait for city crews. Cindy Andrew, CAP 35 News. So far it appears that office... No, so far, it appears no office equipment was damaged in the public works building. The water treatment plant did have some problems earlier with ice jams, but that's been taken care of since the temperatures have warmed up. And that new Yakima police station, they had some pipes burst, but there are no reports of any serious damage. Well, one portion of a recall effort against the Natchez mayor. A car drove by and five or six shots were fired. The shots missed Ariano, but those shots and others have frightened some neighbors into moving away from the area. One lady was so scared of retaliation that she refused to be seen or heard on tape, but she did tell us how angry and upset she's become. She says, I love this house. I love it here, but I have to move. My kids are scared, especially my youngest, who won't even go out to play in the front yard. Police think the shooting is in retaliation for several shootings across town on East Adams Street. Barbara Escobar's house has been hit many times. Three weeks ago, someone shot at Barbara and her son in the family car. And last summer, shots were fired at another Escobar home in Yakima. A neighbor of the Escobars, also afraid to go on camera, is tired of the violence. It's scary. It's very scary. Because um, my kids are afraid to sit right here. They sit in the living in the floor. The bullets flo flies everywhere. I'm scared they might hit my kids. My son's scared to play outside. He can't play outside. It's my daughter, I don't let her outside either. The neighbor believes the Arianos and other local families have been shooting at the Escobars because the Escobars won't join their gang. Oh, no. Police believe no, there are some other families involved in these shootings, but they say it's been hard to make any arrests because neither side... More SBA loans uh, in, in the inland northwest than all of the statewide major banks combined. Campbell says one of the bank's big assets is the staff. Many have worked there 10 years or longer. And he says they also strive to meet the philosophy of providing outstanding responsiveness to customers. Campbell says he sees outstanding opportunities for the future for Pioneer Bank as the only locally owned bank in an area where economic growth looks to be a sure thing. Paul Shoemaker reporting for CAP 35 News. Campbell says slow growth in the central Washington area during the early 80s has increased to healthy economic growth today. He says that trend should continue. Well, it's Monday night. That means another Monday night football game coming up. And unless they've been under a rock, they know you're from Cleveland. They know where your heart is tonight. Browns by seven. I'm going to go out on a win. Browns, Browns by seven. By seven. Up next on Cap 35 News, bullets fly as a feud between two Yakima families continue. A new national survey shows a growing trend of violence in schools. We're going to check on the local trend tonight. And certain video games may soon become off limits to minors. Don't go away. Cap 35 News next. Now, the local news you need from the people you know. This is Cap 35 News at 530. Yakima's most complete local news coverage with Dave Evelyn, Dana Cowley, Sports with Michael King, and Weather with Shannon Renius. With the Yakima Valley's top stories, this is CAP 35 News. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to CAP 35 News this Thursday. I'm Dave Edel. Thank and you And I'm Dana us. Cowley. Glad you could join us. Tonight's top story, how to stop a drive-by family feud before it turns fatal. Now, police say these families have been fighting for a long time, and they also say they have some evidence that indicates that these same families have been involved in several drive-by shootings in the last year. Police also think the latest occurred just last night. It was at a home on Swan Avenue, and it was the third such shooting in the last three weeks. Somebody shot at a man as he was working on his car. No one was injured. But police and neighbors know it's only a matter of time before somebody is hurt or killed. Police say they're doing what they can, but they haven't gotten a lot of cooperation from the families involved. And as a result, there have been no arrests made in any of these shootings. Now, the neighbors are tired of this ongoing dispute. This is the second drive-by in two weeks alone on Swan Avenue. As CAP 35's Monique Gamash reports, while some have an idea of what this fighting is all about, they know for sure that the problem won't be solved by using guns. 
At around 8 o'clock last night, 27-year-old Jesus Ariano was working on his car in front of his Swan Avenue home. Look, cooperate. Monique Kamash, Cap 35 News. One of the neighbors says if she could afford to, she would move her family to another home outside of this line of fire. Well, you know, it's driving the neighbors nuts, and it's causing some headaches for the police department as well. The Yakima Police Department says it's at wit's end in trying to solve this ongoing family dispute, so they have called a truce in hopes of ending the violence. Police say they've responded to dozens of calls related to this ongoing feud dating back to last summer. But Yakima Police Sergeant Craig Baird says every time that they try to put a case together, no one's willing to testify, fearing further retaliation. So police are going to try another step. What we're trying to do actually is uh, trying to arbitrate uh, between these two families, trying to get them to uh, you know, settle our differences other than uh, by such violent means. You know, we would much, much prefer uh, these two settling their differences otherwise uh, through uh, talking it out primarily if, if it's the safest way. Sergeant Baird says it's frustrating that people won't step forward to help, but he's putting a plea out to all citizens, asking them to call him if they see anything that could help them with this case. Bottom line, no one's been arrested or charged with any crimes in any of these drive-by shootings. Now, if arrests should come, offenders would face reckless endangerment charges, which carry a maximum sentence of five years in jail and a tenth. Success Stories on CAP 35 News is sponsored by Steve Dahl and Associates. Advertising, public relations, graphic design, brochures, logos, videos. Steve Dahl and Associates. More than great ideas. Tonight's success story features a local financial institution that has escaped the trappings of the large corporation, but they still do more business in one area than any other bank in the state. Cap 35's Paul Shoemaker has the story. Pioneer Bank in downtown Yakima has emerged from the big bank takeovers to be Central Washington's only locally owned bank. They started in 1977 with 350 local investors, and today they're listed as one of the highest rated banks in the country. President Paul Campbell says that quality is mainly due to the loyalty of local people who like to deal with a local bank that supports the community. Local banks uh, only have one place to invest their money uh, primarily, and that's right in their trade area where you take uh, regional banks and nationwide banks and that sort of thing uh, are, are going to invest where they can get the highest return. Well, we really only have one place to invest, and, and that's in our local trade market. Pioneer Bank offers all the regular banking services, but their forte is helping businesses get on their feet in central Washington with small business administration loans. We are the leading bank in the inland northwest by a large margin. In fact, we make 